name is David Luxton. I'm the Horning and Dow Chair, one of the two. I need a green, I don't think it's here. Uh, Horning and Dow Chairs at uh, OSU uh, in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. I want to welcome you to the final lecture in this year's series on culture and religion in the United States. I especially want to thank my colleagues, Amy Collinger and Chris Nichols, for working with me this year and designing the series and uh, hosting it. Uh, many of you have uh, joined us uh, for other lectures in the series. I want to thank all of you for your support and encouragement. I also want to thank uh, Bob Pecno, who is at the other end of this camera, uh, for all his work uh, on uh, the series. And I especially want to thank the uh, Horning Endowment uh, and the Humanities for their generosity in supporting programming like this uh, at OSU. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Amy Collinger, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, David. Um, I need to say especially, I mean, a really true thanks for involving me in the process of being part of the lecture series. It was a whole lot of fun this year. Oh, I'm a little home. sad this is the last one. We're going out with a bang, but um, it's been a really lovely time, so thank you. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Richard Brennan Fox as the final morning lecturer in the series on religion and American culture. Um, I think of Richard Fox as the historian who takes stories we erroneously think we already know something about and illuminates them in such a way that not only do we see new facets, but often at least I see an entirely different narrative, uh, a new story with different resonance, and more importantly, different significance for how we understand North American religious history. From his revolutionary book on Reinhold Niebuhr, um, that came out from Pantheon and Cornell, to his lyrical, that's the only word I can use for it, lyrical book on the Beecher Tilton scandal, it's one of my all-time favorite books in my own field, um, from the University of Chicago to his recent work on Jesus as a cultural trope in American society. That's from Harper Collins. Um, and this doesn't include his work on the history of insanity, consumerism, and moral discourse. Um, Richard Fox's work is always surprising, and it's surprising in all the right ways you know, for me as a, um, as a scholar. And I'm very excited to hear his thoughts about Abraham Lincoln this afternoon. I'm sure you'll do the same thing. I also owe a debt to Richard Fox that I have the opportunity to repay by telling a quick story. When I was a graduate student, I'm deeply uncertain about my own work, I had a fellowship at Notre Dame. At the time, I was excited about narrative as a form of historical writing, um, and I wrote a somewhat experimental paper for a conference at Notre Dame that did not go over especially well, um, because it was <laughs> as, um, understood as a little bit um, beyond what normal uh, historians do. I was quite deflated by this, and um, Richard took me aside and gave me a pep talk. I don't know if you remember this at all, okay. vaguely. Um, gave me a pep talk about owning my work and not sacrificing unique pieces of it to convention. Um, and it gave me heart and has shaped, I think, the scholar of the comp. So thank you very much for that act of kindness. Um, more generally, beyond his kind of personal generosity, um, Richard Fox studies how ideas, beliefs, and cultural practices develop in relation to social structures and individual quests for meaning. He's especially intrigued by the curious intermingling of religiosity and secularity in the United States. Uh, he observes that this borderline of piety and worldliness is a very fruitful area for further historical research. Professor Fox trained at Stanford and has held academic positions at Yale, Reed, and Boston University. Since 1999, he's been a professor of history at the University of Southern California. He's had fellowships from the ACLS, the Guggenheim, and the Mellon Foundations, and in addition, he's received numerous awards for his writing, and we're so happy to have you at Oregon State University. That's a really lovely opening. Thank you, and, and thank you to David and Bob and others, I'm sure, who were involved in this series. And I had a great time already today at lunch and at coffee afterwards, meeting several of you. It's thrilling to me to be back in Oregon. I taught at Reed College for the 1980s, basically the decade of the 80s. And I became very attached to this place both Reed and Oregon. So for me, this is not just a homecoming, but a coming back to a whole aura of 
Northwest, which for me made such a difference. I had young children at the time I was at Reed College, and you know, our, our dreadful decision on weekends was would we rather go east to Eagle Creek and hike up towards Mount Hood, or would we rather go to Oceanside and, and play amongst the rocks? And it, it was a, my kids looking back, they're now parents of their own, they look back at their time in Oregon, it's quite magical as I do myself. So I'm delighted to be here with you to talk about Lincoln and delighted to know that it's Oregon outside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you today about Lincoln's religion, as I see it, and also about the religion of Lincoln that developed, yes, after his death, but you can already see the seeds of it developing even before his death. And so that period of the formation of the religion of Lincoln is what I've been most working on lately. And I have a book coming out in February, conveniently for the publisher around the Lincoln's birthday. Mm -hmm. And it's called Lincoln's Body. And I will advert to it today, but I'm not going to really talk about the book as such. I'm going to talk about this juxtaposition of Lincoln's religion and the religion of Lincoln. But the book centrally concerns that formation of the religion of Lincoln even before his death. And I'll give you a, a little tiny glimpse of that towards the end with the help of some images, because truly the religion of Lincoln depended on images. He conveniently arrived on the scene as a politician when photography was invented. And therefore, his career is documented in photography, we have at least 120 some odd photographs of Lincoln. He's the first politician who truly used photography consciously to develop his political image and his political power. His advisors were very conscious of that as well. All right, I'm going to start. Part one is going to be the religion that Lincoln himself believed in, the kind of religion that he practiced the faith of Lincoln, his personal religion. And then part two will be the, the, the religion of Lincoln that developed, but paid great attention to part one, namely Lincoln's own religion, and made claims about his own religion as part of that effort to develop Lincoln as an icon after his death. There's no agreement about Lincoln's personal religion. I could spend all of the time just outlining what some of the disagreements are, but I've decided just to give you my view of Lincoln's personal religion. And I'd sum it up by making four basic points. The first of those points concerns his belief in a sovereign God. This is very obvious, and we know this from his own words. And my feeling is we always have to depend on Lincoln's own attested words, those words that he actually wrote down himself, as opposed to the writings of others who claim to have heard him say X, Y, and Z about his personal religion. He strongly believed in a sovereign God who acted in history, a God whose purposes in controlling history were not disclosed to human beings. The second inaugural address of 1865 is the key text on this point. And it's all the more emphatically a statement of his own position because he developed the ideas in it over time in private writings, meant only for himself. So we know he didn't just concoct this address in some desire to please the public. In 1865, when he gave his inaugural address on March 4th, six weeks before his death. He really believed what he said in that address. He felt that this sovereign God was an absolute power. And those of you who know the history of Calvinism a bit may know already what I mean when I say that this belief didn't make Lincoln feel submissive and just totally responsive to whatever he might intuit himself from this sovereign God. On the contrary, Believing in an absolute sovereign God who kept his purposes hidden made Lincoln feel all the more power to do whatever he considered the best, to perform the best action 
according to his own lights, as he kept putting it during his presence. So it was a reassurance to him to know that God was controlling things at some distance from human knowledge. He was empowered with that belief to go forward and make the difficult decisions that he had to make during the Civil War. Providence was always in play. He is a big user of the word providence, the word God, the word the Father. It's this first point that I want to really drive home. There's no doubt about this sovereign God, Lincoln's thinking. Where there's some degree of doubt is whether this was a personal God. And there's been a big debate about this just lately among Lincoln scholars. And the answer has got to be yes and no. That God is person-like, clearly, because that God has purposes, according to Lincoln. And so in that respect, one would have to say this is a person-like God. But often when people make the claim that he believes in a personal God, they want to push, I think, beyond the evidence to suggest that Lincoln had a personal, prayerful, back and forth conversation going with God. That, I don't think, is in the evidence at all. Um, we have that kind of claim being made by people after Lincoln's death, but he doesn't himself ever say that. He's, I'm sure many of you know the phrase that Barack Obama has attributed to Lincoln. And I urge you to look at Obama's 2011 prayer breakfast speech on his own faith. It's a fascinating document because it's almost as if Obama is trying to spell out Lincoln's personal faith. And so he contributes to that discussion, I think, about how Lincoln has played in American civil religion since the 1860s. That phrase that some of you may know is, according to a recollection of Lincoln after his death, Lincoln said, I've been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I had no place else to go. And that is taken as a proof text in a survey of Lincoln with this pious connection to this Father God. I don't think we can take that quotation as anything but apocryphal. And so we get back to Lincoln's attested belief in this sovereign person-like God. And then the second of the four points is that Lincoln is remarkably inattentive to Jesus. He doesn't want to associate himself with the vast expansion of Jesus' heart religion that took place during his young adulthood and was still going on into his presidency. He's, he's someone who runs the other way when he hears about Jesus as a personal savior. He doesn't ever express an interest in redemption, in grace, in atonement. He's all about God the Father, so much so that a well-known Jewish leader in the 19th century, Isaac Wise, went on to become a major figure in the late 19th century in American Judaism. He believed, really, that Lincoln was more like a Jew than a Christian. <laughs> and the same thing, intriguingly, was said about Randall Lieber in his day, that Randall Lieber had no real ecclesiology, he just had an ethics and a theology. He was not down on Jesus the way I think Lincoln was, but he was relatively inattentive to the saving grace of Lincoln, that his brother, or, or, or Jesus, that his brother H. Richards is much more particular about. Okay, so Lincoln is basically not a Jesus believer, and in that respect he resembles Franklin, who was also a big believer in the providence of God, Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson in the early 19th was a big booster of Jesus, but as a philosopher, not as a you know, founder of, or of, of an icon of a faith of heart transformation. Lincoln, Franklin, and Jefferson all ran the other way when the subject of conversion to a heart religion came up. And indeed, a Methodist tried to convert both Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Nobody tried to look. It was too obvious that he wasn't interested in that respect. He's, he's not 
just a believer in the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures, but one might make an argument that he does care much more, and that he certainly has attested writings to the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures than he does to the Jesus of the New Testament. All right, there's a third element of Lincoln's religion, and that is one that I think only becomes apparent when you let yourself become a cultural historian of religion as opposed to just a historian of religion. And that is to, to pay attention to the way that Lincoln was superstitious. He's a person who believes in what David Hall would call a world of wonders, omens. Dreams for Lincoln reveal what may happen. And so, oddly enough, on the very day of his assassination, in a cabinet meeting in the White House, that morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, he told his cabinet, and we know this from attested writings of the time, he told his cabinet that he had had a dream about a ship traveling rapidly over the water. And if you've seen the Lincoln film by Spielberg recently, you'll have seen near the early part of the film, it's probably the third scene, or maybe the second scene of the whole film, there's a depiction of this dream. It's a remarkable dream because it's very rudimentary in Lincoln's telling of it to his cabinet. But it does indicate that Lincoln believes that this ship traveling rapidly across the water always portends some great news, he says to his cabinet. But when he says great, he doesn't mean good. So we systematically today misread those words to think it's always good news that he predicted. No, he predicted great news, big news. It might be good, it might be bad. And he made that clear in his enumeration of instances now for the benefit of his cabinet where he had had this dream before and never told anyone until this very day. So he was hiding this superstitious streak until in the celebration of the fall of Richmond and the surrender of Appomattox, he's on April 14th telling his cabinet that he's a superstitious guy. And they, they talk back to him. We don't know who, but it could have been Grant, it could have been the son of the Secretary of State Seward, who more or less laughed off the idea that his dream could have had any significance as an omen or a portent. He stuck with it, though. According to our source, writing at the time, Lincoln went right back at them and said, I'm telling you, this means something great is going to happen. So there's this whole side of Lincoln, his dream life especially, where it's not what you would expect of a modern man, as we, I think we define modern in the late 19th century. He's, he's got this kind of popular folk wisdom side to him, and that impinges on his religious faith. Therefore, I think we have to conclude that not only does he believe in a sovereign, external, distant God, lots of people in the modern world would do that, but he's also got a world of forces out there which have nothing to do, apparently, at least he never said they did, with this God he believes in. I'm sensing that the God belief of his was an effort to move away from the world of wonders, and he never quite got there. Mm. Had he lived longer, he would have. He would have gone off into the late 19th century. He would have, a normal lifespan would have taken him easily into the 1880s. And he would have made his peace with, I think, the modern secular slash religious belief, which would have perfectly well accommodated a distant sovereign God, but not this kind of superstitious world. Indeed, one of the respondents to him in the cabinet, he says to him, you know what? It could be that it's just your mind talking to you. So it's this wonderful moment of early psychological theory developing. We don't know who said it. I'm suspecting it might have been Frederick Seward, some Secretary of State. Lincoln blows that off and says, no, something great is going on, just because I had this dream. The fourth element of Lincoln's personal religion, then, is, and the last that I'll address today, is simply that 
when we're studying somebody's religious faith, here's where biography really helps, as opposed to just studying people as a group. There are certain times when Lincoln just goes ballistic on something he believes in. And we have many examples of this where he just, in effect, loses it. He doesn't get angry, but he gets passionate about the evil of slavery. He says this again and again in his debates with Douglas, says it in other ways in his writings. He, he says that it's always the same old story. Defenders of slavery are part of that ancient claim that you make bread with the sweat of your brow and I'll eat it. This drives him to distraction, this idea that the labor of one person will be stolen by a second person. That commitment, that anti-slavery commitment has often been doubted in the 20th century, early 21st century, because he doesn't become an abolitionist. He doesn't try to destroy slavery as soon as other people believe it would have been possible to destroy it. He's a constitutionalist who insists on going slowly so that things will actually take instead of just be imposed on a population that isn't prepared for them, either constitutionally or culturally. So this commitment to equality makes him passionate. And there, I think, also, just like with the, the maybe pre-modern superstitiousness, you have to take both of those things into account when you talk about somebody's personal faith. What are they most passionate about? It's almost Tillich's ultimate concern, that is, the thing that really drives a person. And here we might make the mistake, I think, of seeing this passionate commitment to equality as just a political commitment. I think for him it's religious, certainly religious in its intensity, but I think it also has a religious character to it. And here, I think Obama is another wonderful witness to what Lincoln may have meant by a faith in equality that was religious as well as, as political. I would argue that although he never articulates it, he actually agrees completely with Martin Luther King about this. King made clear that there's a religious part of an equality doctrine. You not only believe that everyone's equal, but you do not hate the people who disagree with you. There's an ethical dimension, which for King has Christian roots in Jesus. It's, it's this determination that you're going to hate the evil system, but not hate the people who believe in it. You're not going to have rancor or, or recrimination against individuals. You're just going to destroy their system. And indeed, you're going to provoke violence on their part as you do it. But you're not going to ever call them evil. And I think, had Lincoln ever had the time to figure out what he wanted to say about that, I bet that's the kind of thing he would have said. And there, we would have had a clear statement of how his personal religion is connected to that doctrine of equality. An example of this going ballistic on, on uh, i just read you a quotation here. It's, wonderful to find him during his lifetime saying something publicly about his personal religion. It's rare to find that. But here's a case. In 1864, he writes for the Washington Chronicle, and he intends this to be made public. He writes it in mind. He, he says, on Thursday of last week, two ladies from Tennessee came before the president asking the release of their husbands held as prisoners of war at Johnson's Island. That's in Ohio. They were put off till Friday when they came again and were again put off to Saturday. At each of the interviews, one of the ladies urged that her husband was a religious man. On Saturday, the president ordered the release of the prisoners and then said to this lady, you say your husband is a religious man. Tell him when you meet him 
that I say I am not much of a judge of religion, but that in my opinion, the religion that sets men to rebel and fight against their government because, as they think, that government does not sufficiently help some men to set their bread on the, to set their bread on the sweat of other men's faces is not the sort of religion upon which people can get to heaven. He's incensed. And he's going to go public with his passion on this subject. It's, it's a remarkable document because of its publicity. And there are many other examples. Of, I mean, the speeches that we all know, or at least now we should know, the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural, they should be supplemented by one other, which I commend to you to read as soon as possible. If you're interested in this, passionate Lincoln who gives what we might call religious intensity to this equality commitment of his. It's the Dred Scott speech of 1857, after the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court. Lincoln expressed his feelings about slavery by saying, the slave owners are not content merely to hold their chattels in bondage. They insist, and then he just keeps going, can't stop. He says, they insist on keeping their slaves in a prison house to which there are 100 keys required to open the door. And then they send those 100 keys with 100 messengers to the farthest stretches of the country so that they could never be found. And still they are not satisfied that they've done enough to imprison their slave in his prison house. It, it's, when you read him at that moment of passion, you, you sense that you've got to go there if you're going to understand his personal religious faith. OK, let me now switch over to the religion of Lincoln. And I'm going to do it just by transferring I mean, a little moment of transition before I get to the actual um, points I want to make. It's, it's that there is a civic faith, we might say it's a secular faith, that Lincoln holds just as firmly as he holds his religious faith in God. It's his Republican commitment to a civic order in which leaders do not presume that they are superior to followers. He's very, very committed to this, just as he is to equality of all people to keep the fruit of their labor. He's committed to this equality of leaders with the led. His whole generation, he was born in 1809, they're still very conscious that most of the Western world is in a state of transition towards democracy in the sense of republicanism, where you have representatives whom you elect. He's very worried about monarchic habits of mind coming back. So he makes a point of always interacting with people. He makes mixing with his fellow citizens, as he always calls them, his first order of business. And you saw this in the Lincoln film of Spielberg, if you've seen it, where the people more or less mob his office, and he just sees whoever comes. They have to wait a while, but he'll see them. He, he believes in this constant interaction between people uh, whether they are the chief magistrate or just an ordinary citizen. And the chief magistrate is going to become an ordinary citizen again. It's just a temporary arrangement that he happens to be in the White House. All right, so this Lincoln, who's always intermixing with people, is my starting point for talking about the religion of Lincoln that develops after this life. And I'm going to show you some images now that <coughs> start with the cover of the book of mine that's going to come out. And this, I've only just gotten this from the publisher. I, I love this picture because of how, how much care it gives to the visualization of Lincoln's body. If we had time, I would, if, if you were my students, I would ask you to tell me what this picture shows about Lincoln's body. But just in the interest of time, I, I will just tell you a couple of things that 
mattered to me as I tried to understand this religion of Lincoln that develops after the, after the Civil War and after his death. When he was first publicly known nationally in 1860, people were shocked at his appearance. He was called ugly. He was called grotesque. And these were not just Democratic with a capital D people who wanted him to not get elected in 1860. These were also Republicans with a capital R who, after May, knew that he was their candidate. And so one of my favorite stories about this is a, a meeting of Republican, a meeting in Brooklyn in which Republican officials, local officials, more or less indoctrinated the troops about you know, what we were going to say about Lincoln in this campaign. There's this wonderful smoking gun for me in this report in, I forget which New York newspaper, where this guy up on the stage tells the rank and file of, it's like the Young Republican Organization of Brooklyn. He says, okay, now remember this. Lincoln is homely, not <laughs> ugly. <laughs> yes. I mean, he repeats it. Lincoln is homely. <laughs> All right, so people regarded him at best as homely, but it's very illuminating to think about why. It's not just his face, although people complained about that. He had too big a nose, he had too big a set of ears, he was pockmarked, he looked like, and one person actually called him this, this is a phrase from that time, white trash. Other people, I think, were more worried about something else, and I bet some of you have intuited what I'm about to say. It's simply that he was out of proportion. <laughs> his head was too small for the rest of his body. His shoulders were too thin, too narrow for the rest of his body. He was all legs. And people were very worried about, you know, the even the Republicans, about the impression he would make as a national leader even internationally, that it just didn't look presidential. It's fascinating to see the ways in which people interpret this physical character of Lincoln. And that really leads me to, well, I said this at coffee a few minutes ago, let me just tell the rest of you, I think what people were hoping for was Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> they, they, wanted, they wanted somebody who looked sort of like Lincoln, but was proportioned better. <laughs> you know, six foot one would have been fine. And sort of a, a handsome face. <laughs> an English elite, son of a poet, instead of son of a you know, backcountry farmer from Kentucky. Okay, so um, Lincoln's body actually is closely related to what I was saying about mixing with everybody and being this Republican leader who didn't accept any separation between Lincoln <coughs> and Lev. And lots of his friends and colleagues in government were always trying to get him to not mix with people. They knew it was dangerous. He knew it was dangerous. But he wouldn't stop. Okay, so what's important here is that in the summer of 1860, he's the Republican, Republican candidate for the election in the fall. Everybody's calling him ugly and grotesque. So he knows that there's only one way to deal with it, to mix with the people. Because every person who ever met him said, he looks ugly when you first see him. But as soon as he starts talking, everything changes. His face turns radiant. You then believe you're in the presence of a great man. Systematically, I could you know, give you hundreds of examples of people reciting that formula. Ugly until you hear him talk. And then it's just a different story. And indeed, that's what happened at the Cooper Institute in February of 1860, when Lincoln persuaded the elite journalists of the United States, Horace Greeley at the New York Tribune, um, William Cullen Bryant at the New York Post, they were skeptical. And when he got up on the stage, they were ready to give up on this, I mean, the idea that this guy could ever be a national leader. Even when he started speaking, 
he sounded like a hick. His accent was bad, his voice was too high, but all it took was a few minutes and everybody was in the palm of his hand. And that really was a trans transformational moment in his political fortunes for 1860. Okay, so let's move along here. This is a fabulous cartoon. It was in a weekly magazine of humor. And you probably can't read the bottom, everybody, but it, it's very funny, but it's also very perceptive. It's about how the portraits of Lincoln are changing over the course of the electoral campaign. Here at the bottom, <laughs> if you can't see it, it says, his first looks hideous, cadaverous, repulsive. But then the photographs and the illustrations make him look better. As his chances improve, so do his looks, he is now tolerable. And then finally, being chosen, he grows quite handsome, even angelic. <laughs> it, it, what matters to me about this is just it truly reflects the public opinion about Lincoln in 1860. And there's so much massive evidence here, it's just not possibly not true. He is regarded as a problem, as a physical specimen by even the people who um, are supporting him. That then pushes him all the further into this Republican way of life in which he will maximize the chances he has of opening his mouth with people and showing them that there's something else besides this ugly appearance, which he obviously regarded as a detriment to his political career, as did all of his supporters. Okay, let's move on to, here he is, a handsome guy, just as they predicted, and this is the, the, based on a photograph of 1857, a well-known photo of Lincoln, this flyer was actually tossed from the balcony of the hall in Chicago, where he was nominated for the presidency by the Republican Party, the Wigwam, which was, it could seat, I forget, 10,000 or 15,000 people. And this, thousands of copies of this image were tossed out to the party faithful so that they would know what a good looking guy they had. <laughs> and this is Brady's famous photograph of Lincoln on the very day that he spoke at Cooper Institute in 1860. So we're getting already a sense that a certain look is gonna serve Lincoln well and become the look by which we remember him. It's gonna be a frontal stare and the famous, most single most famous photograph of him by Gardner in 1863, right before Gettysburg, is that looking right at you, almost Uncle Sam wants you look which became perhaps the most um, iconic photo of Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> and here we can see the religion of Lincoln taking form. This image gives us a post-mortem version of my first point about Lincoln's personal religion, that is, there's a God providentially caring for us. And this God has called Lincoln to his side along with, with Washington. Also, with respect to the Jesus absence in Lincoln's personal religion, we get tremendous effusions of belief after his death that Lincoln actually was a professing Christian, that he actually did care about Jesus. Plenty of people stepped forward to say, Lincoln told me that he <coughs> was a professed Christian. Others stepped forward and said, well, he might not have gotten around to professing while he was alive, but he told me that he was going to. <laughs> and so we get that assurance that he was a Christian. That mattered tremendously to a lot of people who, including Mary Lincoln's pastor. Lincoln went often to church with Mary, the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, where the preacher, Phineas Gurley, was you know, very interesting to him. Lincoln, in effect, 
if you want to sum up his personal religion, you'd say he was theological but not spiritual. Just the re a, a reverse version of our today, oh, I'm spiritual but not religious. Lincoln loved theology and loved going to hear the preaching of Phineas Grove. And so I think we can see here an analog to God the Father and God the Son. In every way possible, people are imputing to Lincoln a Jesus-type career, even if not a Jesus belief, that is, Jesus as his redeemer. In dozens of examples, we get Lincoln on his deathbed. And here, I think we can see not only a desire on the part of the American population to have gotten last words from Lincoln, like Kennedy, he was just taken away from us <coughs> like that. What were his last words? There were no last words. This mattered deeply to people in 1865 that there were no last words. They've been listening to and reprinting the last words of every important person for decades. So you can see these exact same lithographs about earlier presidents with their last words printed at the bottom. Lincoln didn't give us last words, but he did give us the ship dream. And that mattered tremendously to people in the absence of last words. So did the second round, which was more or less taken as his last words, although six weeks old at that time. This ship dream took on a life of its own and was reissued in more and more detailed versions, which showed Lincoln to have anticipated his death. So by the time people were actually looking at these lithographs, which became available pretty quickly, they had already heard about the ship dream, which was recounted in the New York Herald, <coughs> biggest daily newspaper in the country, on the 18th of April. So it only took four days to get into the press. And people are taking solace from this fact that Lincoln had anticipated his death, because the good death was one that you you had prepared for, and you made your statement of last words to your friends and family. Um, to be deprived of that was a horrible fact for people in the '64, and therefore they leapt at the chance to in effect pronounced as part of their religion of Lincoln, that he was a seer. He could actually see what was coming. That then was connected to his belief in the sovereign God. So he was like an Orthodox Judeo-Christian, at least. He became an Orthodox Christian in the recollections of many people after his death who claimed he had either professed or was going to profess a belief in Jesus. He became a seer in the ship dream. As you all know, he became a prophet in the second inaugural, which truly is a prophetic text, and one thankfully preserved publicly at the Lincoln Memorial starting in 1922, at the very moment when white Americans were forgetting Lincoln the Emancipator. Part of the price of reconciliation between whites and black Yes, whites north and whites south in the late 19th and early 20th century was to suppress the memory of Lincoln as emancipator and insist that his main function was to reunify the country. And therefore, black people took it on themselves to preserve the memory of the emancipator. And anybody who appreciates what happened in the 60s, the civil rights movement, has got to thank countless generations of black people who kept insisting that Lincoln was the events for There are two tracks, separate tracks. They interact, but they're separate after 1865. The religion of Lincoln held by the black people is centrally about freedom and their eventual getting freedom because Lincoln told them so. And it wasn't because he said so. It was because he said what God wanted. And so it's a religious 
belief in Lincoln. White people, yes, lots of examples of people who got the emancipation story alive, but not compared to the big majority that dropped it. And it's the fact that black people had to wait a century for serious legal protections around their freedom. It's always a matter of interest to historians whether had Lincoln lived, things might have been different. We'll never know. We do know that before his death, Lincoln said he recommended to the states that they let at least some black men vote. And so he goes on record on April 11, three days before his death, the first president who ever endorsed black suffrage of any kind. His was very limited, but boy, looking back, W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 20th century, that's my guy, he said. Because it took courage for him to say that then. And indeed, if the apocryphal stories about John Wilkes Booth are true, he was not only in the audience at that April 11th speech at the White House outside of listening to Lincoln, but he is alleged to have told his friends when he heard that remark about black suffrage, that's the last speech Lincoln is going to make. It's a little too perfect to take at face value. And yet, Booth was a very well-known, what we would be told as a segregationist. And, um, so there may be some truth to that. Probably popular too. This is important to me, the fact that there are dozens of these in showing that People were bereft, really were mourning for Lincoln like a, a missing member of their family. That is what they keep saying again and again in the late 19th century. Now I'm going to finish with this slide because it, it gives us that emancipator. It gives us that the central figure is the black religion of Lincoln between 1865 and we're actually between 1860. Already slaves, many sources confirm that slaves heard all about the nomination and election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, and they liked what they heard because their slave masters were so upset. They knew it had to be good news. <laughs> On this day of April 4th, 1865, 10 days before his death, Abraham Lincoln did the Republican thing of mixing with the people. In this case, black people almost completely. And according to the best witness we have, a journalist named Charles C. Coffin of the Boston Advertiser, who happened just by chance to be standing on the dock where Lincoln disembarked from a big rowboat, which he had been reduced to taking because the larger ship had had problems and he insisted on going all the way to Richmond. This is the very day after Richmond fell. Robert and Lee's troops withdrew from, in, during the night of April 2nd, April 3rd, they withdrew from Richmond. Jefferson Davis left the Confederate White House. So on April 3rd, Union troops marched in, including black troops, marched into Richmond. On April 4th, Lincoln shows up in the afternoon on the dock. So black people in Richmond who were forewarned that Lincoln was coming because the press had said Lincoln wants to visit Richmond and Grant says it's OK, we're just not sure what is going to happen. So they were ready. And as soon as Lincoln showed up at a position along the docks where he wasn't supposed to arrive, hundreds first of black people now celebrated their first day of de facto freedom. Who should disembark but Lincoln? That is a miracle in the eyes of the black slaves of Richmond. And so Lincoln then is waiting momentarily for a, what's called an ambulance, just a, a wagon with horses 
take him to the Confederate White House, which is now the Union headquarters. It doesn't show up. And the general in charge, General Weitzel, said later, oh, you know, we thought he was arriving at the other place, and we had it all set up. They arrived at this strange position along the duck. And so Lincoln, at that point, just decided to plunge into the crowd and walk to the Confederate White House, three quarters of a mile. And in doing so, he demonstrated, I think, both his civic Republican faith and his personal religion, which is to express his humble engagement with his fellow citizens and to put himself at risk. He knew he was at risk. But he always was at risk. There's nothing new here. He may, for all we know, have thought that a crowd of black people would protect him better than any bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> According to Charles Coffin, thousands of black people walked with him from the dock to the Confederate White House. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but it was a large crowd. And some white soldiers were there too, the Union troops. Lincoln got up to the Confederate White House and the whole march, we have no idea how long it took, we have no idea what route it took through the city. We just know, according to the best information we have, that he immersed himself in the people and in doing so, set up an apotheosis as a great follower of Jesus. And you can watch this happening day by day in the press of the mid part of April, 1865. Until his death, the Richmond event was interpreted totally as a Republican event. Nobody mentioned Jesus. It was just a leader showing that he had no superiority over his people. Coffin published his story, which was just about that, on April 10th in the Boston Advertiser. A week later, sermons are already being given on Easter Sunday in the North, April 16th, in which people are talking about the march through Richmond and they're interpreting it as another appearance of Jesus. It's like Jesus in Jerusalem a week before his crucifixion. The analogy becomes so powerful it takes on a life of its own. It has nothing to do now with Lincoln's personal religion about Jesus. It has to do with his being like Jesus. And then everybody remembers his simplicity, his humility. He, in fact, becomes the second incarnation of, of Jesus for many people. The last comment I want to make about the Richmond walk is simply how it's been totally forgotten. And the chance we had was lost. Because although Tony Kushner loved the Richmond story and apparently wrote it into his 500 page script which covered the whole period from January to April of 1865. When Spielberg decided to cut out March and April and just go for January and February, centering on the House of Representatives on the 13th of May, Richmond fell out, except that April made it in. You see Lincoln with Grant sitting in Petersburg on April 3rd. That's where they sit outside and they mull over the meaning of the war as troops are walking by them. It would have been easy, given his already broaching April, to put a little glance of this march through Richmond with masses of black people celebrating their love for Lincoln. And, you know, it's just a missed opportunity because Spielberg actually would have wanted to send that message. This is a film about the emancipator. But it's just one of those missed chances where we may have had a revival of this knowledge that Lincoln actually dove into a crowd of black slaves and walked with them from the dock. Today, it's actually called Dock Street 
where he actually was in the landfill and has, has advanced the territory of Richmond. So the dark skin <coughs> the 17th is where he actually stepped off the boat. What a missed opportunity. We, we had a National Geographic special that Lincoln just, uh, in, it's called Killing Lincoln. It's just cashing in on Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Lincoln, which is the mega bestseller of all time of books on Lincoln. The National Geographic version actually showed the march through Richmond, but it missed the opportunity because Lincoln had a little phalanx of officers just walks in total isolation. There's no population of slaves around them. There's just one old black man that Lincoln doffs, that, who doffs his hat to Lincoln. That's in the original report from Charles Powell. But what a missed opportunity that reveals for, for Spielberg, who gives us Grant and Lee doffing hats to each other at Appomattox, but then could have perfectly paired it with Lincoln and this old black man doffing their hats to each other on this march through which we went. Thank you.